David's prayerful conversation ended abruptly with two words, get swimming. Although Maine Island was five miles away, it was closer than Point Roberts, so David set out. Some part in, into the swim, I rolled again the back of my back. I said, Lord, I thought the Psalms tells me that when I need you, I can call on you. Call on me in the time of trouble. Well, and I remember yelling, as, while I'm in trouble, are you going to help me? And again, he spoke and he said, I have helped you. And very calmly, I go like, what do you mean? He says, look around. So I did. I remember stopping my swim and I scanned the entire, I turned to 360 degrees in the water, looking around. I'm looking for a log, a boat, a whale, Flame, you know, yeah. Like, yeah, a little flying helicopter, anything. <laughs> Maybe an eagle. And I go, what? I just saw nothing. I was oblivious to what, and, all, and that thought says, when was the last time you saw Georgia Strait this calm? And all of a sudden I looked around. It was like oil. It was unbelievable. No, Georgia Strait is not like that. It was like oil, just undulating, you know, just, just rolling. I'm like, wow. And then again, get swimming. Soon he was picturing family and friends. Whether it was the beginnings of hypothermia or just his wacky sense of humor, David imagined reading his tombstone. David Bezaherrick, November 6, 1957, September 6, 2003, loving father, loving husband, lousy sailor. Oh, I just <laughs> burst out laughing again. So here I am in the middle of the ocean by myself, splitting a gut, drowning on my own stupid island. Stop it, just stop telling jokes, okay? <laughs> David remembered a trick from his survival training, tying knots in his pants and filling them with air to give himself something to hang on to. What happened was my neck muscles were getting so sore that I, I thought, well, I just turned my head to the side and, and like use it as a pillow. Well, this, the minute I did that, I started humming. And I guess the vibration in my, my head was just frozen. I, I can't even describe. I mean, go, go home, turn on the tap full cold and put your head under that. I mean, that's cold. And that's what this ocean is like. And so I started humming, and the minute I started humming, I fell asleep. I'd slipped off, the, off my pillow, so to speak, my pants. I'd go on underwater, breathe in the, the uh, water, and that woke me up. I'd come to the surface just screaming, no, keep swimming, just do it, keep swimming. You can do it, come on, focus. And of course, I'd lost my glasses. And in the distance, all I could see is these porch lights. I'm squinting like crazy, I'm focus, focus, and I'd go for another hour. And then another hour later, I did exactly the same thing. While David was swimming for his life, his boat Esperance was on autopilot, moving across the ocean without a captain. I believe it was a 900 foot super tanker, came through the pass, through Saturna Island Pass, and headed, I guess, I don't know if it was going to the, to the super port or up into English Bay, into Vancouver, but I have a radar reflector up on my mast here that works well, obviously, because he, he could, they can't see this. I'm, I'm like a little fly down on the water compared to those super big boats. And they picked me up in his radar. So they're watching the Esperance on this track, and they're, I guess, the pilot and the captain saying, we're gonna watch this guy, he's on a collision course. So they're calling on the radio saying, you know, hey, watch, keep your eyes open, they we're coming through here. I mean, how do you miss a 900 foot vessel <laughs> doing 27 knots? Of course, Esperance never changed its course. Well, I guess they realized that they were going to run me down, and he said they did an evasive turn around Esperance, and I, I think he told me that they had night vision goggles, which they got out and looked down into the, into the cockpit area here, and realized there's nobody on board. Soon the Coast Guard was racing toward the unmanned sailboat. Just like in the movies, I guess, pull up beside her, jump on board, and stop her. Then they went down below, to look to see if I was down below. I could have had, you know, could have fallen, could have hurt myself, had a heart attack. They didn't know, so they, they searched around looking for a body, realized I wasn't on board. The Coast Guard set up a search pattern, which David saw about 12 miles away. And I remember saying out loud, well, hey, thanks guys. You'll find me, but I'll just be a body face down in the water. More than two and a half hours had passed and David was fighting the debilitating effects of hypothermia. Now it wasn't just falling asleep. I started to get what's 
tunnel vision. In other words, my consciousness started shutting down. My body was shutting down. And my brain was just, every, all my vision was going narrower and narrower and narrower. So I just had this tube of, of vision and I knew what was happening. Then I started seeing the stars, you know, like, you know, you're losing conscience. I knew what was happening. I wasn't getting enough blood supply to my brain. Everything was shutting down. And I rolled over and there was a, oh, maybe a dozen seagulls above me. And I rolled over and I just looked at them and I said, hey, you guys have been great. Thanks. I said, you know what? I'm not going to make it. Tomorrow on 100 Huntley Street, rescuers search frantically for David Zaharik, but so much time has passed, they don't hold out much hope of finding him alive.